have to say, please be seated for the sermon. You know, a special thanks to uh, Bishop Jeffrey Monford, the Bishop of the Diocese of Steubenville, for his welcome here. He uh, left me with a nice note in my room. Uh, to uh, President uh, Father Sean, and of course, uh, Father Nathan, thank you. Where'd you find? Oh, Father Nathan, thank you. He's been really, if you want someone who knows hospitality, Father Nathan. That's it. And of course, I'm, I'm especially indebted to uh, Amy Roberts. Amy Roberts uh, is here on the faculty at the University of Steubenville. But you think that's where she got her fame. No, it was in Knoxville. It was in the Diocese of Knoxville. There you go, where um, I was the bishop there for eight years, so you don't mind me bragging a little bit. So we're told that uh, Frank Sinatra recorded 17,810 songs. I know this because it's on the Internet. And of all the songs that he, he recorded, a number of them are very famous. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to sing any. However, I am going to read you a little reflect, reflectively the lyrics of, of one of the songs that I've been thinking about for a long time because it so captures uh, a good part of our culture. There could be a couple of songs that did that, but I'm going to recite I Gotta Be Me. Whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, whether I find a place in this world or never belong, I gotta be me. I've got to be me, whatever can I be, but what I am, I want to live, not merely survive. And I won't give up this dream of life that keeps me alive. I gotta be me, I gotta be me. The dream that I see makes me what I am. That far away prize, a world of success, is waiting for me if I heed the call. I won't settle down, I won't settle for less. As long as there's a chance that I can have it all, I'll go for it alone. That's how it must be. I can't be right for somebody else if I'm not right for me. I gotta be free. I've gotta be free, daring to try, to do it or die. I've gotta be me. I'll go it alone, that's how it must be. I can't be right for somebody else if I'm not right for me. I've gotta be free, I just gotta be free. Daring to try to do it or die, I've got to be me. Are you glad I didn't sing that? Now, Jeremiah would have nothing of what I just read. Jeremiah would want to be free. Jeremiah would not want to be a false self. He wouldn't want to live life pretending to be someone he's not. The difference is the Frank Sinatra song, and those of you who are Frank Sinatra fans, in fact, please don't tell my oldest sister I gave this sermon. She loves, what's, what was he called, Big Old Blue Eyes? Yes, yeah, some of you love him too, I see that. But the words that he, he, he spoke or sang are all about him. They put him right in the center of his world. Right firmly in the center. And all of you, thank God for all of you coming to this catechetical workshop because you know that your destiny is about God's plan. And that you come each year, and some of you have come multiple years, because God's plan needs our whole lifetime to uncover. I'll be mentioning an example of some of that. No, Jeremiah heard from the word of God 
that God had a plan from him from the very moment in which he was in the womb of his mother. There was a plan. And that plan, he resisted. He said, I am too young. Many of you may remember that St. John Paul II, in the book that he wrote, I think it was Gift and Mystery, it recalled his 50th anniversary as a priest. So I don't have the math. I think it was, well, I shouldn't even have guessed when it was. It was sometime in the 1990s. And in it, he, he lamented the fact, he told the story that when he was, I think, 37 or 38 years old, he was appointed as an bishop. And he complained to, I guess, the cardinal in Krakow, or Warsaw. He said, I'm too young. And the cardinal said to him, that's a defect that will soon be corrected. <laughs> it's in his book. It's a beautiful statement. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Think back to when that first tug of your heart occurred when you first felt that your destiny was not your own? Probably what brings you here to this conference. I go back to my 10th grade in Catholic high school in the chapel. I'm not sure what drew me there. I'm not sure why I felt the call to become a priest. No priest, no sisters, or anybody in, in, in my family. They were good people, but, but there were no, nobody from a religious vocation. But somehow, it must have been like Jeremiah. I think it has been in your life, where God somehow touched his heart. Oh, there's resistance. Jeremiah says, I'm too young, and you and I have our own words for resisting God's call. But it's much more than the vision of strength and honor. It's a brand of freedom that truly and lastingly makes us free. It's not the kind of freedom that has us seek joy, and it's always around the next corner. But rather, it's a freedom that leads us to serve others. There's a beautiful book that I just finished reading, so you'll be a victim of it. It's uh, by Servais Kingcard. He's a, a Dominican. He died about 10 years ago. It's called The Spirituality of Martyrdom to the Limits of Love. And it's a beautiful book, The Spirituality of Martyrdom to the Limits of Love. They say that uh, Father Quimper is uh, a moral theologian, was probably very influential to St. John Paul II when he did the encyclical Splendor of the Truth. And in it, he says uh, this. He said, no one starts out. In fact, let me read the first word. No one, it seems, spontaneously desires to suffer martyrdom. In other words, no one starts out life thinking, I want to be a sacrificial hero. But yet, if they are open to God's plan and God's destiny, God will reveal himself. You know, it was, I think, in this, uh, this June that Maximilian Kolbe, exactly 75 years ago, in 1941, took a step forward in a concentration camp of Auschwitz. I'm thinking of it because I, I leave for Poland on Saturday. I'll be I'm blessed to be one of the catechists for, for World uh, Youth Day. And uh, Father Colby, St. Maximilian Colby, when I read his biography, was a holy man. He was a devout man. Someone just gave me a little piece of cloth, a little relic of him in devotion to speak. So a very holy man. He was a journalist. He did many things creatively, and he probably thought at one time, well, I'm on my path of life. This is what God wants me to do. And then 1941 came, he finds himself in Auschwitz, and there was a man, a husband and a father, who was designated to die. And he cried out, please don't kill me, I, I have a family. And something moved his heart. Like 
the spirit that moved Jeremiah centuries and centuries before that made him say, I'll stand in his place. The theme of the spirituality of martyrdom, the book, says that martyrdom is not really understood as, as a brave act of giving of life, but rather it is seen as a humble task of witnessing in our words, but also in our behavior. We are so much taken up by the love of Jesus Christ in our lives we can think of nothing other than to give back. And the only way we can give back the love to the Lord is by we, the way we treat the person in front of us. And so Maximilian Kolbe did just that. The gospel reading talks about a parable. It's a parable of nurturing the gift, and in, it's got a sad part to it, doesn't it? I tell young people when I'm in, in the process of getting them ready for confirmation, I say that if I were a coach beginning a, a baseball team during the summer, certainly I would look to see if there were some people who had a little talent. But the second thing, and maybe the more important thing I would look for, is who shows up for practice. In fact, I tell them that there are people who've been given musical talents and have squandered them because they've never developed them. They fell on rocky ground. No, you come to this catechetical conference precisely because you want the ground in which the seed of faith is planted to be fertile, to be rich, so that not so much you bear great fruit, but rather Christ bears great fruit through you. Bishop St. Apollinaris is known very little in the church. I looked him up, though, and I found that there's a high school named after him in California. And I also found that in the second century, he was an apologist. He was a catechist. And when Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, had the law of the land, it was Apollinaris who bravely stood up and witnessed to his faith in Jesus Christ. It, it wasn't because he wanted to become a bloody martyr. It was simply because he was so much in love with the one who has first loved him that he couldn't do otherwise and generously witness to the faith. It's not so much, I gotta be me. No, it's, I gotta seek God's plan so that I can be the best me I can be. And that with his grace, I may embrace 